Just to recap, it's a method to detect a transgene or any other gene in the genome of the host that we are interested, okay? And we need two things for that. One is a probe. Probe is made against the gene that we are interested in to see that what the, whether that gene is present in the host genome or not, okay? We have to label it. And there are four major labeling techniques, NIC translation, random priming, three prime end labeling, and five prime end labeling, which you have studied already in the DNA modifying enzymes. Okay. So after you have prepared the probe, you set it aside at minus 80 degrees centigrade or minus 20, whatever facility is available with you. Okay. And then you start preparing for southern hybridization. And the first thing is you must isolate the DNA, chromosomal DNA, from the host. So it is total genomic DNA. It contains the chloroplast DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, and the nuclear DNA, which are present there in the plant cell. Okay, if it is an animal cell, obviously it will be mitochondrial and the, the nuclear DNA. However, you can apply the same technique to microorganisms too, if you want to see a gene in a bacteria. And when you isolate the DNA from there, you can perform southern hybridization the same way you are performing with plant cells or the animal cells. Okay. So, the first thing, DNA purification. The second thing, DNA fragmentation. The DNA fragmentation, you never know the enzyme. If you're an expert, then definitely you know the enzyme, what are the different enzymes which you can use. So, just to tell you a little bit more about that, that when you are an expert, how you can select the enzyme. You can select those enzymes which don't cut inside your cassette. Okay, so if they cut inside the cassette, it means that it will break the whole cassette into two or three parts, and you don't want that. So always select a restriction enzyme. You can select multiple different restriction enzymes, but make sure the enzyme does not make an internal cut on the cassette, on the gene cassette. I'm repeating it again and again, gene cassette means promoter, gene, and terminator. Because you want to see the whole operon at one place. If you get a single band, it's mean, it means it's a single insertion. If you get two bands upon exposure to X-ray film, it means there are two different integration. And if there are multiple bands, it means there are multiple integrations. And while selecting the transgenics, keep in mind that we always look for single integration event in the eukaryotic system, preferentially. In a prokaryotic system, it can lead to gene silencing. And we are never interested in gene silencing. We want to express the foreign gene. So we select those transgenics which have got a single integration and looking at single integration is only best if you know the enzymes which don't cut the cassette that you have integrated into the host genome. Okay, so fragmentation is very important and the selection of enzymes is very important. And if you don't want to concentrate that which enzyme to select, just digest the chromosomal DNA with four or five different restriction enzymes and run that in different wells, okay? So maybe one of them will not cut the cassette, okay? So you can depend on a chance or you can do it yourself. If you know the sequence of the cassette and obviously you should because when you are making a cassette, 
you know the sequence of the promoter, you know the sequence of the gene, and you also know the sequence of the terminator. So you can use some software to identify the restriction sites in there and select. I'm not sharing the screen yet. I'm just talking. Are you listening now? Kadesh? Yes, sir. It's yes, sir, yes. Okay. So I will share the screen in a while. Okay. Until I reach the point where I was last time in my lecture. Okay. So after fragmentation with an appropriate restriction enzyme or a set of restriction enzymes, you run your sample on the gel to resolve it. And the next thing is actually blotting. Before blotting, you perform three important things, which is highly essential. If you forget to do that, you won't get any results. The reason is that while you run the gel, the DNA is double stranded and you need to convert it to single strand before you transfer it, before you blot it onto a membrane. So blotting is an important step which actually requires that you treat the gel first with, with, the, with a deep urination reaction. That is, you treat your gel with SCL, 0.2 normal SCL is most often used. Okay? And this process is called deep urination. It removes the purines. Because the acid is quite diluted, it is 0.2 normal. So there is only occasional deep urination, not very frequent, breaking down the large DNA fragments into smaller DNA fragments. Okay? And the purpose is of deep urination is only and only the transfer, facilitation, so that the DNA from the gel can easily move to the nitrocellulose membrane or high bond N membrane due to just the diffusion process of the buffer. Okay. So our next step for gel treatment is denaturation. That we need to separate the double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA. And this is done with the help of NaOH. And you use 0.2 normal NaOH as well in this case. So you just put your gel into a tray having these solutions for 10 to 15 minutes and you transfer to the next solution. Okay. The final treatment is neutralization. That after you have done with deep urination and denaturation, you need to neutralize the gel so that a high pH should not damage the membrane to which you are transferring your DNA. Okay, so gel treatment, then you start blotting immediately and you saw the setup that I showed you that you just use a base of gel electrophoresis system, you put the appropriate buffer in the tanks and then you connect the two chambers with the help of a blotting paper. Okay, on top of that, you put your gel upside down, the wells facing downward and then you put on the top membrane, then two more blotting paper layers which are cut according to the size of the gel, okay, and on the top of the gel then you put a thick layer of tissue papers, at least four inches to six inches thick, okay, on the top you can plate a glass plate and then you put a weight, the buffer from the tanks starts moving upward and when it is moving it is taking the DNA from the gel onto the membrane. DNA sticks to the membrane, it does not move along and stays there. While the buffer keeps on moving and keep on transferring the DNA from the gel onto the membrane. Okay? So there are two types of membranes I have been talking. One is nitrocellulose membrane and the other one is nylon membrane. In case of nylon membrane, it is a high bond N membrane. Okay, so high bond N membrane, if I write here, you can read it actually. That is high bond N plus. Okay, it means it's positively charged. Okay, and this, these are the two 
different types of membranes and you can see actually the comparison between them. It's a hydrophobic binding in this case. In this case, it's a covalent binding. It's positively charged, DNA is negatively charged, so there is a bonding bond formation there. In this case, DNA is just loosely attached to the membrane, okay? And the membrane is hydrophobic, it repels the water or buffer while keeping the DNA attached to it, but it's not, it's a very loose kind of bonding. This nitrocellulose membrane is very fragile. And I will give you an example that when you break an egg, the shell of an egg, there is a membrane inside. Okay, I hope everyone of you might have noticed that membrane. That is nitrocellulose membrane. Okay, so in this case, an artificial nitrocellulose membrane is used, which is exactly identical to the membrane which is present in an egg. Okay? So that's highly fragile when dry. If you bend it, it will break up. So this is the biggest problem with using the nitrocellulose membrane. So try to avoid using that. Okay, it will break up very frequently and destroy your experiment. Select nylon, nylon N plus membrane for southern hybridization. It's, it's not fragile at all. It's very flexible. It does not break. It is very strong. And even you try to stretch it, it will give you a lot of resistance before it breaks. Okay? So this is about the probe that you synthesized separately. Okay? And we have been talking about the fact that even if you need nick translation or you perform hexa primer labeling, the length of the probe is about 200 to 300 base pair. Okay? So if your gene is 1 kb or 2 kb in length, you are still getting fragments of the probe. Not the complete gene is, is uh, uh, probed or labeled as a whole. Okay? Because random primers, they are attaching within the gene region. Okay? Randomly at some places. And where the polymerization stops, that will be the length of that and that polymerized product. And the polymerized product is the one which is having radioactive material, not the complete gene. Okay. So this is another fact about these probes. In both cases, the probe is just using the same probe. It will have 200 to 300 base pair length of your probe. If it is smaller, then there are chances that you will see non-specific hybridization. Some of the drawback which I hardly see actually in nitrocellulose is lower background. It's only due to its hydrophobicity that even if you treat this membrane with, with roughly with naked hands sometime, it does not attach too much DNA because it is hydrophobic. But this membrane is very, very sensitive because it has positive charge on it. And if you don't handle it right, all the negatively charged molecules can attach to this one. Even the DNA from your fingers or the protein from your fingers, which are negatively charged, can stick and give you a high background. That high background is visible when you expose this membrane to the X-ray film. Okay? So you will see black spots or black, sh black shades. So in order to avoid that, if you handle properly, this nylon membrane will not give you a lot of background. So make sure that you are not getting that because otherwise that black shadow can, can actually superimpose the, the, the places where the probe has gone. So you cannot detect that the, any black space there, which can give you an indication that there is a detection of some gene cannot be exposed to basic solution. You know, you know, this is the reason we have to perform the neutralization reaction. Okay. So this nitrocellulose membrane is very much susceptible to IPH. It easily denatures, just like it dissolves into that solution. Okay. However, 
this high nylon membrane has no effect on that. But, but it is always advisable to neutralize it. Can you tell me the reason? You can think about it. You can tell me the reason actually. High pH will not allow actually the hybridization of the probe with the membrane because that's the denutrition condition, not the hybridization condition. Hybridization condition requires a neutral pH. Okay. So not easily reprobed. What it means that you have a membrane and you want to hybridize the membrane with one gene cassette, one gene. And then you want to use the same membrane for hybridizing with another gene to save your work. I mean, you have done the digestion and you have transferred everything. Now you want to detect multiple number of genes on the same membrane. In this case, you can't do it. Okay. In this case, in the case of nylon membrane, you can wash out the hybridized probe from the membrane by taking it to high stringency conditions in the washing process. So you can easily use this membrane four or five different times for hybridization with different probes. So this is one of the advantage of nylon membrane is that you can reprobe it several times. Now again that setup of plotting that I was discussing and uh, you need to remember the placement of everything there because the things are in a specific order. Okay? Blotting paper to connect the two chambers and bring the buffer to move upside. Okay? Then the gel, the membrane, two additional blotting papers. The blotting papers are thicker than the tissue papers. That's the reason I have presented it here in thick lines. Okay? pile of tissue papers, about four to six inch thick, and then a glass plate and a weight on it. You don't need to sit there on the top. You just, you can keep a one liter water on the top and that pressure is enough to keep these air spaces away between the tissue. Okay, and this is the migration of the liquid, which is shown in the red arrows. The blue arrows, they indicate here, the movement of the DNA from the gel onto the membrane. When this buffer is moving, it also takes along with it the DNA material that is transferred. And this process, remember, it's called southern blotting. It's not called southern hybridization. Okay. Blotting is different from southern hybridization. Southern hybridization is the complete process starting from point 0.1 to point 0.10. Okay. While blotting is just one part of that. Okay. So never write southern blotting if you want to write southern hybridization. Okay. These two terms mean absolutely different. So use the right term. That just transferring the DNA from the gel onto the membrane is called southern blotting. Okay, and the whole process of detection of the gene is known as southern hybridization. Now, look at this. This is linking the blotted DNA to membrane. If you look at the characteristics of nitrocellulose membrane and the high bone end membrane, high bone end membrane is positively charged and it holds the DNA quite tight. It is, you don't have much chances to lose the DNA during the washing processes. It will keep on sticking to the membrane all the process. But if you're using nitrocellulose membrane, it is now essential to covalently link the DNA with the nitrocellulose membrane. Now you do it. You can do it two ways. Whether it is a nylon membrane or high bone membrane, you have to perform UV cross linking. What is UV cross-linking? Everybody is now familiar with the microwave. Okay? It's an instrument just like microwave, but it does not have microwaves in it. It has UV lamps in it. Otherwise, all the shape of that equipment is 100% identical to a microwave. 
and the knobs outside there also. So it, this equipment has the capability to estimate the radiation of that UV tubes. Okay, it keeps track of that. So what you do is that you just click on or you push the button for UV cross linking. It automatically calculates that for how long that equipment should expose the membrane to UV light at a specific energy state of that tube light. Okay? Because it keeps in mind that how, how long the tube has been used. So with successive usages, this time goes on increasing, but it hardly exceeds one or two minutes. Okay, So you just press the button for UV cross-linking and you will see the light coming up inside after you have placed the membrane in it, okay? And then you will see the click just like in microwave and you open the door and take out the membrane. Now remember one thing which is very important, never let the membrane dry after you have blotted it. When you pick it from the gel, when you have done blotting, I said, you remove the membrane and the gel together and invert that. You place some marks with a lead pencil at the position of wells so that you should know this, which is the well one position, which is well two, three, four, and so on positions. Then you pick the membrane and immediately you go for cross-linking. Okay, you will cross link. If you don't have a UV cross-linker available in the lab, you can use a baking oven, okay? You set the baking oven to 80 degrees centigrade and you leave the membrane overnight in there, okay? Next morning when you come, the membrane is obviously perfectly dry, but the DNA is now completely attached to the membrane strongly attached okay so you don't let the membrane dry before it goes to the oven or the or the UV cross link so you keep the membrane when it is wet and then you can dip the membrane into the buffer to get it wet again okay but the drying of the membrane previous to this treatment can actually lead to the loss of DNA, okay? DNA usually pops up from the surfaces where it has not bound with a covalent linkage, okay? So loss is less in case of nylon membrane as compared to the nitrocellulose. There's a big loss in case of nitrocellulose because it's just non-covalent linkage between the membrane Okay. So you can rinse the membrane afterwards in the buffer, which is known as SSC, okay, before hybridization. And what you do in a hybridization is just a round bottle. It's a round bottle which is open at both sides or open at one side and closed. It depends then what kind of bottle you purchase. Usually you try to purchase a bottle which is closed at one end and has a cap on the other side. So you can put that membrane inside the bottle, okay? According to the size of membrane, you select the bottle. But bottles are of different sizes. But the placement of the membrane is in such a way that your lead pencil marks, they are towards the inner side of the, of the bottle, not towards the glass side of the bottle, okay? Because you are going to, going to do the hybridization with the probe. So, the DNA is towards the lead pencil mark side. Remember that. Don't put it the other way. Otherwise, your membrane will not hybridize with the probe because the membrane is sticking to the glass. It's providing no space to the probe to approach it. Okay? It's common sense that you keep the mark size inside so that it can easily touch the probe. And if there is any complementary, 
one complementarity between the probe and the chromosomal DNA, they can then join together. That was the sixth step. And then seventh is after putting that membrane into the into the bottle, you need to do one important thing, and that is called membrane blocking. What is membrane blocking? Membrane blocking is that actually you had a clean membrane and then on that membrane you transferred the DNA from the gel, okay? So the membrane is like a page on which you have DNA at very specific positions. When you add probe, probe is also DNA, it can also bind anywhere. On the membrane, membrane is positively charged, it can bind the DNA. So in order to block the surface of the membrane so that it cannot bind to the DNA non specifically, you perform a step known as membrane blocking. So what you do, simple, simple method is, you can use most conventionally all over the globe, what they use is Solomon sperm DNA. It's cheaply available. Okay, you break this through uh, this DNA by passing through a uh, narrow orifice needle attached to a syringe. Okay, you take the DNA in a syringe and you push the DNA with a great force through the needle of that syringe and it breaks up into small pieces. And then you can use that broken DNA to put into the tubes and keep on mixing the tube by a very specific hybridizer. It's, a, it's an equipment actually, hybridizer. It has a revolving platform. So you insert the tubes in the revolving platform and it's, it keeps on mixing the, the, the blocking material with the membrane membrane surface okay so all these solvents for dna will bind to the membrane and your dna from the gel is by already binding to very specific surfaces okay on the membrane so the membrane gets completely covered with dna one is the dna that you have transferred and the rest of the places where the solvents for dna will bind so now the probe is not capable of binding the membrane because the membrane is completely covered with DNA. Now an important point here. You are using a gene for detection, which is either a bacterial gene or a plant gene. And you know that this gene is not there in an animal system, for example, in the human beings. Okay. So, you can block your membrane with the human DNA as well. If you don't have solvent sperm DNA, you have to have substitutes. Because certain hybridization is very specific. You are trying to detect a gene in the chromosomal DNA. So, you can use a blocking agent, which you are sure that it does not have that gene. You can isolate the DNA from E. coli if the gene is not there. You can isolate the DNA of E. coli, you can break that DNA and hybridize to the membrane. The purpose is to cover the surface, to avoid the binding of the probe to the other surfaces of the membrane because they are positive each other. So you have to neutralize a kind of the membrane. And be very open on your mind. This is these techniques, these methods. They don't mean that you always have to perform. You, have, you can modify if you have some knowledge of it. So Salman's sperm DNA, if not available, you can think of some other sources. You can find out through the blast search that which of the genome, if for example, you can look into the E. coli genome for the presence of that gene. If E. coli does not have, that gene, then you can isolate the DNA from E. coli and use that for working the membrane. Okay, so keep your mind open. This is a recipe, and this is the reference slide for you actually. 
okay, that if you ever have to perform southern hybridization, there are a lot of questions in why. Because these, there are a lot of things that you add in there. Okay, so here is the recipe for both the pre-hybridization buffer, and I will tell you what is the hybridization. Pre-hybridization contains the blocking agent. Okay, so you block the membrane first. So first what you need is that after transferring the membrane into the bottle, you put this pre-hybridization buffer along with the Salman sperm DNA or any DNA of your choice. It means you are blocking the membrane. So pre-hybridization is an essential step after you transfer the DNA onto the membrane and you take the membrane to the bottle for hybridization, perform a pre-hybridization with the same buffer, except that in case of pre-hybridization, it has got Salmon sperm DNA. In case of hybridization buffer, it does not contain Salmon sperm DNA. But what you add here, you add probe here, okay, that you have prepared. Okay, this is very, very important. And keep that in your mind. That the difference between a pre-hybridization and a hybridization buffer is, Pre-hybridization contains a DNA to block the membrane, okay? And the hybridization buffer contains the probe against the gene that you want to detect. So you do this at about 50 to 60 degrees centigrade, pre-hybridization. <coughs> For four to five hours on a rotating tube, shaker, incubator shaker, okay? And then after four to five hours of the UD count this pre hybridization of this is removed just by decanting. If few one few hundred microliters are left, it does not matter. Okay. You don't have to completely remove it. But just the majority of the pre hybridization of the is removed. It is around 20 to 30 ml. Okay. And then you put in there the hybridization buffer, 25 to 30 ml. You take one ml out of this buffer and take it into an append of tube. You take just a few microliter of probe into that append of tube, just four or five microliters of the probe into the append of tube where you have added hybridization buffer, one ml. Close the tube cap and tightly close it because you are going to boil it and boiling will develop a lot of pressure inside the tube and your cap will pop up, releasing the radioactive material into the environment. Maybe it will contaminate your hands. So make sure you use the parafilm to tightly, tightly cover the cap so that it can bear a lot of pressure which is developed inside the tube when you are heating the tube to denature the probe. Probe is in double stranded DNA form, remember, you have to denature that as well. So you denature the probe in the hybridization buffer. The quantity of hybridization buffer is one ml. The quantity of probe is four to five microliter. Okay? You just boil that for one to two minutes. And then immediately add that content of the append of tube in the portal having the rest of the hybridization buffer which is 25 to 30 ml. You don't pull the probe directly on the membrane. You pull the probe in the buffer in the center of the tube. Okay. Otherwise when a hot probe will be dropped onto the membrane even if there is DNA there which you have used for blocking purposes. Your probe will, is very hot. It will remove that and it will attach to the memory. So you will see a lot of black, intense black color on the exit when if the probe falls directly on the memory. So take your micropipe dine down to the bottom of the bottle and inject the probe that you prepared after boiling in the bottom mix that in the bottom and then cap it and you can then take the 
put it in the horizontal position and put it in the rotating incubator. Just set at different temperatures. And those temperatures are very, very important. The binding of the probe with the genomic DNA. Particularly where your gene is present. Okay. So I will talk about the temperatures shortly. But remember what we did here. We added 100% formamide. And remember, formamide drops the annealing temperature. Do you remember the use of formamide in PCR? If you ever add a formamide to your PCR reaction to combat some of the amplification problems, addition of formamide also reduces annealing temperature. So much so, you can count it like this, that, you see this is 15 ml, okay. this is total is 30 ml. You added half the volume of formamide to total of 30 ml that you are going to add to that volume. Okay. It means there is 100% formamide in 15 ml in 30 ml, it is now 50%. 50% formamide will reduce your melting point or annealing point by about 15 degrees centigrade. So if you are performing a hybridization at 60 degree, and if you are using formamide, what would be the annealing temperature? 60 minus 15. That is 45 degree. Okay. If you are using formamide, it reduces our temperature for annealing. Okay. So you don't have to hybridize at high temperature. You need to bring it down according to the percentage of formamide. 50% reduces the hydration temperature by 15 degrees centigrade. So instead of 60 degree, you go from 45 degree. It's very advantageous. Why? You are familiar with the aerosol. When we are dealing with radioactivity, the aerosol is very, very dangerous. Okay. Water evaporates even at room temperature. If you leave a tray of water in a room for a for a night and then once you come back in the morning you will see a lot of the, a lot of water has been evaporated. Okay, this is a normal process. But if you are heating a bottle to 60 degrees centigrade, a lot of liquid in there will evaporate, generating an aerosol, the vapors of water coming out of the bottle through the cap and contaminating the room with radioactivity. Okay. So people usually try to avoid these aerosols by adding form of light. Okay. So if I, if the tube is at 45 degrees centigrade, it will generate less fumes as compared to the tube bottle, which is at 60 degrees centigrade. And you can easily see actually the uh, the evaporation <coughs> when a high salt solution evaporates what it leaves behind it leaves behind salts and if you see a lot of white colored salts on the cap it means that there is a lot of evaporation from this water I'm putting more time on it because this is highly essential you should be designated to handle the radioactivity before you perform southern library. You must get some training. And this knowledge will help your training. Nobody will allow you to work with radioactivity if, if you are not certified to work with that. And that certification is that you know all these things, that how to handle these materials, how to handle the radioactivity. Okay, so formite 
I mean, is used to lower the kneading temperature so that there should be a lower amount of aerosol formation. The eighth step is hybridization. It means you remove the pre hybridization buffer after four to five hours, okay, and then you decant it and you put in there the hybridization buffer, which I already told you are prepared. From the 30 ml, take 1 ml out in our pen of cube. Put 3 to 4 microliters of your probe in it. The total volume of the probe is 20 microliters. Okay? Because leak translation, hexa, primer labeling, 3 primer labeling, or 5 primer labeling, all they end up in a 20 microliter reaction. You are taking 4 to 5 micro from there, putting it in the hybridization buffer, 1 ml in an append of tube, boiling that tube. And then, when it is boiled, you immediately transfer it to ice. Okay, and you have your bottle is ready for hybridization buffer. You put the remaining 25 30 ml hybridization buffer first in the bottle, and then you very carefully take out the one ml from that append of tube with a pipette man which is designated for radioactive work. Very carefully, you slowly take up that 1 ml liquid and you take it to the bottom of the bottle so that it should not get onto the membrane. So you just put it down in the bottle, you just shake the bottle a little bit to mix the contents and then you put that bottle in the hybridization oven. Okay, again, just like you did in pre hybridization and you leave it overnight so that the DNA can hybridize easily. Because the tube is rotating, it means the solution is mobile. We're not keeping it stagnant, okay? It's completely rolling all over the night. And the DNA which finds the complementarity to the blotted DNA will hybridize. If it is no complementary, there will be no hybridization. In the next morning, when you come back, you proceed for post hybridization washing. What does it mean? It's the removal of the excessive probe that has not bound to the DNA which you transferred out to the membrane. One ml of that hybridization makes up to it. So some of the DNA has bound. If the, if the complementation was found on the genomic DNA of the membrane. So you have to remove the excessive DNA which has not bound with the genomic DNA. So you decant again the contents of the bottle, but this time you don't decant it in a water tap. You decant it in a reservoir which is labeled for radioactive waste. Okay, So that that bottle is treated very specifically by certain companies. You cannot decant that in the water tap or anywhere else to avoid the condemnation. So always waste the hybridization mix after hybridization into a radioactive waste bottle. Okay. So wash the membrane twice after decontent weight. One XSSC having 0.1% STS for 15 minutes each. And the temperature here ranges from 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 50 to 60 degree centigrade. Okay, remember that. So 50 is actually low stringency condition. 50 is the low stringency condition, 60 is the high stringency condition. It means that if you are hybridizing a gene, to look for the homologs of that gene, which may have some 10 to 15 percent difference in the sequence of the probe with the genome, genomic uh, DNA with a particular gene, then you use lower stability. But if you want to detect a transgene, it is obviously very the sequence is very specific to the transgene. So you go to high stringency conditions, that is 60 degrees. So you hybridize for detection of transient for a specific probe at 60 degrees. And you select a lower temperature 
if you don't know the exact similarity of the nucleotide sequence of your probe with the gene of your interest. Okay, so you select those stainless condition. You wash this twice with one X SSC and 0.1% STS. And these are two washings. After these two washings, you need to wash another time for 15 minutes. Okay, and this is now a lower salt concentration, 0.2x SSC. STS concentration remains the same. Temperature remains the same. Okay, so this washing actually helps to remove the non specifically bound probe with the memory. Okay, at high temperature, that probe is just like a primer which is 200 nucleotides long. And when heated and it is non specifically bound, it will get denatured from that DNA. Okay, if it is highly specific, identical sequence, it will not be separated. Okay. So this is the temperature actually, which is kept for this one, okay? And then the last step, the last step is exposure of your membrane to the X-ray film, okay? Now if you we summarize, this is a factorial summarization of this southern hybridization that you run the gel, and this gel you perform blotting, and you do some treatments here, and after the blotting, you pick up the membrane from there, and then you put the membrane inside the bottle, and these red color materials, they show you the probe molecules, which are radioactively labeled, or fluorescently labeled. At the end of it, what you see, that your probe has got bound to very specific places on the transfer DNA of the membrane. Only if this probe has highly high degree of similarity or identity with a nucleotide sequence, which is there in the genomic field. Okay, and then you expose this membrane to the X-ray film. The X-ray film will actually show you that the hybridization, the radiation, it will produce black color. Okay, so you can see, okay, this is my lane number one, it's a marker. Okay, this is lane number two. I digested the chromosomal DNA with this enzyme, and this gives me one clear band. It means I have single integration event. Single integration event in this case, this enzyme too. Single integration, but the positions are different. Can you answer me why the positions are different? The gene is same, but with different restriction enzymes, the position varies different restriction enzymes, which are not cutting inside your cassette, they will randomly cut the genomic DNA. One enzyme may cut close to the cassette, another enzyme may cut away from the cassette, generating different size of fragments of genomic DNA due to differences in the restriction sites in there, okay? And that's the reason. But the take home message is, you must see a single band to, to show a single copy insertion. Multiple copy insertion will result into more than one match and that is not desirable at all, okay? So, finalizing this, the critical parameters too, to handle certain hybridization is the hybridization temperature, that is 50 to 60 degrees centigrade, washing temperature, that is also 50 to 60. If you keep on towards the lower side, it's low stage density emission. If you take the temperature towards the higher side, it is high stage density concentration. And then you notice that in the initial washing, we use, we use a higher concentration of excess. One X SSC is used. But at lower condition, it's a lower stage density condition. We use 0.2 X SSC. Okay, high temperature, low salt is a high strain density condition. Low temperature with high salt is a low strain density condition. Okay, you have this now written here.
So you can keep this, you can remember this, that if in the hybridization, pre-hybridization, you use this condition, it is high stringent ratio. It means it will most accurately determine the integration event. Okay, the transgenic to wind highly specifically. If you go here, it means you should expect non-specific hybridizations. Okay, and this is done specifically when you want to see some gene homologs. Okay, and you understand the sequence is not hundred percent. Identical between the homologs. If 50% formamide is used, keep the temperature at 42 degrees centigrade for 20 for 90 minutes. For 100% identity between the probe sequence and the genomic DNA sequence, the transgene sequence. Okay. Use 37 degrees centigrade if you are doing it at lower stringency. Okay. So the homology should be 95%, 32 degrees centigrade. Now this is very low temperature. It will not form any aerosols. But you can now work at lower temperatures with the addition of 50% formamide. Remember, this is very, very important in aerosol generation. Okay, and this gives you really good results as well. And the final is signal detection. That is through autoradiography. You put a X-ray film on the top of the membrane and you put it in a cassette actually, just like the X-ray cassette you are seeing, we use the same cassette for that purpose. Put the membrane there on the top, put the X-ray film and put it at minus 80 degrees centigrade overnight. Next morning when you come back, you will develop the film, okay, manually or through an automatic system. You just feed that film into that and you come out with the results, just like that I have shown you here in this picture, okay? Now, I hope there are, you understand the summary of the procedure. It is 10 step procedure. And I have described each of those steps. So if you are required to answer in detail, okay, not in the viva, obviously I'm not going to ask you all the 10 steps and how you do in that. But you should remember, even why I can ask you all those steps, perhaps, not the elaborations of that. Okay? So remember all these 10 major steps which are involved in southern hybridization. And finally, I want to show you two last slides just to ask you a question. This is a real hybridization experiment, and you see the pictures here. Okay? What you see is discrete, discrete lanes, okay? These, these fragments of DNA, which are hybridizing the probe, this is an X-ray film, okay? This is the background, gray color is background. And this is the signal that you are detecting. You see these bands, they are very much discrete, okay? And in another case, you see the bands are not discrete at all. They are quite spread. So what's the difference? How would you recognize that what kind of hybridization is this? You won't be knowing it. I will tell you, okay? If you have a gene inserted into a plasmid and you want to screen the plasmid, for the insertion of that particular gene, one thing is you cut it out or you see sequence the DNA okay, to identify the right clone, that this is the clone that has your right insertion in it. The alternate way is you perform a synthron on the plasma DNA. You digest the plasma DNA, to take out the cassette, or run it on the gel, and this is the type of results that you will see. If you are doing southern hybridization on a genomic DNA, you will never ever get such discrete bands. Your message, the signal, will always be spread out. Okay? The spreading is actually due to the high intensity of the radioactivity. Okay? The radioactivity is not limited. The lane keeps on 
spreading on the X-ray film. If you keep that X-ray film over the membrane for a week, maybe this may burden at these places. We'll see a white black smear here. Okay. So you can reduce the smear by shortening the exposure time. I mean, if it is an overnight of 12 hours, say, you can expose the membrane again. You can expose the membrane again and again. It does not matter. Okay. You can take out the X-ray film, you can develop. If you see, there's a lot of spreading of the signal. In 12 hours, you can re-expose the membrane to a fresh X-ray film and expose for six hours. Because you have to publish this either in a paper or either in a thesis. So you must remember that you can control the spreading of the signal by reducing or increasing the exposure time of your membrane to the axial field. Okay, so with this, I'm ending this lecture.